A reading from the book of Nehemiah. Nehemiah deals with oppression. Now there was a great outcry of the people and their wives against their Jewish kin. For there were those who said, With our sons and our daughters we are many. We must get grain so that we may eat and stay alive. And there are also those who said, We are having to pledge our fields our vineyards, and our houses in order to get grain during the famine. And there were those who said, We are having to borrow money on our fields and vineyards to pay the king's tax. Now our flesh is the same as that of our kindred. Our children are the same as their children. And yet we are forcing our sons and daughters to be slaves. And some of our daughters have been ravished. We are powerless, and our fields and vineyards now belong to others. I was very angry when I heard their outcry and these complaints. After thinking it over, I brought charges against the nobles and the officials. I said to them, You are all taking interest from your own people. And I called a great assembly to deal with them and said to them, as far as we are able, we have brought back our Jewish kindred who had been sold to other nations and by now are selling their own kin, who must be brought back by us. They were silent and could not find a word to say. So I said, the thing that you are doing is not good. Should you not walk in the fear of our God, to prevent the taunts of the nations, our enemies? Moreover, I and my brothers and my servants are lending them money and grain. Let us stop this taking of interest. Restore to them this very day their fields, their vineyards, their olive orchards, and their houses, and the interest on money, grain, wine, and oil that you have exacted from them. Then they said, we will restore everything and demand nothing more from them. We will do as you say. And I called the priests and made them take an oath to do as they had promised. I also shook out the fold of my garment and said, so may God shake out everyone from the house and from the property who does not perform this promise. Thus may they be shaken out and emptied. And all in the assembly said, Amen, and praise the Lord. And the people did as they had promised. The word of the Lord. Thank you, God. Well, that's a reading. <laughs> I want to just mention a few things uh, today. I was about to say this morning, habit, <laughs> but uh, this evening. Um, about the spectrum between every man for himself, and we're all in this together. Because what we see in this reading and this story is a breakdown that results from famine, from fear, from uncertainty, and a sense of save yourself. Even to the extent of letting go of everything you had struggled so hard to build or to create or to plant, even members of your family. How many have heard of the World Economic Forum? It is often called Davos, which is uh, the Swiss Alpine resort where this forum has been held since 1971. Don't worry, you can go. The membership is simply $62,000 a year. So it's very inclusive. Peter Goodman has released a book entitled Davos Man, How the Billionaires Devoured the World. Now, framed 
uh, the phrase Davos man actually was first coined by a Harvard University professor, uh, uh, Samuel Huntington, where he wrote a book or a paper in 2004 about this new elite that was rising to the top globally. Uh, it was an emerging global super class of people. He referred to them as gold collar workers. Yes. Goldman describes his definition of what a Davos man is. A rare and remarkable creature, a predator who attacks without restraint, perpetually intent on expanding his territory and seizing the nourishment of others while protecting himself from reprisal by posing as a symbiotic friend to all. Sound familiar? Goldman quotes Salesforce founder Mark uh, Benioff as saying, in the pandemic, it was the CEOs in many, many cases all over the world who were the heroes. Goldman, however, points out that the charitable giving by the rich is as minuscule as the smallest fraction of what would be given if each of them paid the taxes that their janitor pays. You know, I used to have this practice where whenever I read a headline about somebody giving millions and millions of dollars to this or that, I would look up their worth and I figured the percentage and I compare it to what I gave last month to the church. And guess who always won? Me, percentage wise. So there is this concerted effort of charitable giving by billionaires that somehow we are saving the world. We are creating a narrative of inequality and justifying it by our so-called charity. In 2020, many of you remember that? 500 million people descended into poverty. Well, the wealth of billionaires grew by $3.9 trillion. And this, while their philanthropic contributions fell to nearly an all-time low. Of the 650,000 paychecks, Paycheck Protection Program, remember that? The CARES Act? <clears throat> to help businesses survive? Uh, 650,000 checks were written for $150,000 per business. And out of those 650,000 checks that were written, how many checks were written to black entrepreneurs? Take a guess. 143. That's 0.2 ten thousandths of a percent. So, we can get really upset by this. But, as people point out, the blind spot in Goldman's analysis is that he just focuses on the very wealthiest. He doesn't acknowledge other contributors to this economic inequality. Those include those in the top 10 and even 20% of income. the upper middle class, who Richard Reeves has labeled the dream hoarders. You know how easy it is to start moving over to every man for himself. You know, I've got to protect myself. I've got to build up something for myself and my children. The dream hoarders. So there is that temptation to use the pointer finger instead of the thumb, right? 
when it comes to who gathers the blame some of us have been involved with sacred ground it's a curriculum that the episcopal church has embraced and it points out and provides the metrics for how the united states became the prime economic power in the world and it can be summed up by one word slavery the cotton industry and other industries powered by forced free labor created incredible wealth in this country the wealth that white people in particular have built their economic security from Jim Wallace has referred to America's original sin as slavery. And so speaking to you as a white, a privileged white male, I am more and more aware of how we brag about hitting a triple when we were born on third base. That is trouble. That troubles the water right there. <laughs> right? And so I ask myself, as a pastor, what is the role of the church in all of this? Jesus, to me, was all the way over on the spectrum of we are all in this together. And so maybe part of our role as a as a church, is to remind us that that is our true calling. Our true calling is to stay with that constantly and not slip over in fear or in greed or in hunger for power into that other direction where we might be like the Davos people of God in this story who began to grab for what they could grab. Uh, there is a, a saying, be yourself um, because everyone else is taken. <laughs> and I think the beauty of this Nehemiah story and the hope that is in it is that what Nehemiah does is he calls the people to be who, were, who they were meant to be. This is not guilt. It's not based on guilt. He wakes the people up to realize that we are all neighbors, that we are all people of God, that everybody is to be treated with dignity, love, and compassion. So we were made for justice. It's not some something over there, when we participate in caring for this, the, the situations in which people find themselves, <coughs> the struggle, the poor, that's what Jesus did. Jesus didn't leave the poor behind. He was radically inclusive in what he did. I like what Cornell West said. Justice is what love looks like in public. Justice is what love looks like in public. It's a call to action, but it is more than that. It is a call to be who we were created to be. When I think of the billionaires, or I think of myself, or I think of people and all humanity, it helps me to remember that they were created to also share. And if they're not doing that, that's a sad thing for them. But it doesn't preclude us from getting busy today in terms of participating in justice, participating in actions of equality, because that's love. That's love. So here's your question today. <laughs> Where do you put yourself on that spectrum from every person for yourself and we are all in this together? How much fear keeps you 
from living freely in the service of other people and in the kind of energy that extends your life into acts of justice and concern. Think about, I know part of the exercise today is to write down those places where injustice happens on these slips of paper and uh, we're going to create a chain that will be broken later. Uh, but also think about what you did recently that reminded you of who you are. That reminded you of, in the words of Nehemiah, the call that is deep within your soul to love and serve all people. So that is what will energize transformation and justice in our world. So is that pretty clear? Mm -hmm. Okay. So we get in groups and you decide.